In this video, we're going to discuss beam diagrams and how to calculate them. So very quickly, we'll talk about starting with a moment diagram and using that to calculate a slope diagram, a deflection diagram, calculating the constants of integration within those diagrams, and then we'll do a quick example. So the moment function tells us that the moment of a beam, which is a function of x on the beam, divided by the modulus of elasticity and the inertia is equal to the second derivative of the deflection of the beam in that location. So let's let q be a loading function. We've learned previously that if we integrate q, we get the shear function. If we integrate the shear function, we get the moment diagram. If we integrate the moment diagram and divide by this physical constant, we get the slope of the beam along that location. And if we integrate one more time, we'll get the deflection of the beam along that location. As we've done previously, we're going to neglect C1 and C2. And the reason we're going to be able to do that they're going to be considered zero as long as all of our external forces and moments are included in the loading function. So when I create this loading function, I'm going to put everything happening at the boundary conditions into it. And therefore, my boundary conditions will be zero. In other words, by definition, V of zero is equal to zero, and the moment at zero is equal to zero. If there is a moment, it's a concentrated moment that occurs uh, um, on the right hand side of zero. C3 and C4 are not that easy to neglect. So they're going to be turn, determined by the boundary conditions of the beam. So for instance, for a cantilevered beam, the slope is defined to be zero at zero if it's cantilevered at, at x equal to zero. And the slope will be zero at zero. And the deflection is also defined to be zero at zero. So both C4 and C3 are equal to zero. For a simply supported beam, it has a different set of boundary conditions. So while it might be useful to memorize these for some very simple ones, we really don't have to. We can always just calculate them as we go. So a couple of useful tips. Normally, if we're designing a beam to withstand a certain deflection, the deflection will be more dominant than the yield strength. In practice, uh, a bridge will stand up a long time after it's no longer fun to walk on. So for instance, think of a suspension bridge across a, a large chasm. It's swaying and it's doing a lot of deflecting, but it's still perfectly safe. And yet, at some point, it begins to be less comfortable. So in general, if we're trying to eliminate deflection, we will no longer have to worry about it yielding for that deflection. Looking at this equation, uh, the only material property is E in that equation. I has to do with the geometry. M has to do with the loading condition. Okay. For most alloys, E is a constant. Therefore, low-strength steels typically resist deflection as well as high-strength steels. So that means if we're designing for deflection, a low-strength steel is very often just as sufficient as a high-strength steel to get the same deflection. Let's do an example. So in this particular problem, we have two concentrated loads and one distributed load across the whole beam. It's cantilevered on the left-hand side. And we'll say that the length units are in terms of millimeters. So writing our, our loading function, we would need to calculate, first we would do a free body diagram. We would calculate the boundary conditions, M1 and R1. And after we did that, we would just apply it here to our forces. So minus W, you turn W on at zero, and you can leave it on forever. Um, then you have to turn the two forces on at 0.5 meters and 1 meter. Integrating, we get V of X. And again, the constant of integration is equal to zero uh, by definition. Integrate again, and we get M. And this should be straightforward. Now we're going to do it one more time and divide by EI, divide by our physical constants, and we're going to keep the C3 this time. We're going to calculate what that third constant has to be. So starting with that function, 
and recognizing the slope at zero on the cantilever beam has to be equal to zero, plugging in zero everywhere. Um, this term is zero, this term is zero, this term is zero. This has not yet turned on, so this term is zero. This has not yet turned on, so this term is zero. So this entire equation reduces to zero plus C3, which has to be equal to zero. So therefore we know C3 is equal to zero because the slope at zero has to be equal to zero. Okay. So repeating that for y, so let's integrate one more time to get deflection. And again, we know that deflection is equal to zero on the left-hand side because it's a cantilevered beam. We plug in zero all the way through, and now this will calculate for us that C4 is also equal to zero. So this justifies what we were saying uh, about C3 and C4 being equal to zero for all cantilevered beams if they're cantilevered on the left-hand side. So our final solution now, starting with a loading diagram up here, we now have shear, moment, slope, and position formulas that can be graphed. Inventor will do this for us, and so looking at Inventor's plot, this is what the slope diagram looks like for that loading condition. And this makes sense. The slope starts at zero and then increases. It means the beam is bending. So it has a higher slope out here toward the end than it did at the beginning. That makes sense. And deflection is increasing. Starts at zero and gets as greatest the furthest. And again, if the beam is deflecting, we would expect that it has the greatest deflection up here at the end.